All right, everyone, welcome back to week two of Intro to Astro 2022. Today, we will explore together real astronomical data from the ESO Gaia mission, as well as the NASA Exoplanet Archive. And we will discuss uh, the review paper on uh, our closest uh, planetary uh, system uh, that around Proxima b. Um, finally, we'll hear from Maria, who will tell us how she became a young astronomer. Uh, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to post your questions in the live chat window, or if you have any other feedback, please let us know on piazza.com about how we can improve the lectures. All right, without further ado, let us move on to the first topic today, uh, the ESA Gaia mission, and our first speaker is Priya. Thanks, Philip. Thanks so much. And um, yeah, I'll just start off. Hope you can see my screen now. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, great. So, hello everyone. And today I'll be covering my topic, which is on how to Gaia with by uh, on this thing. Gaia is a ESA satellite, which was launched specifically to do excellent astrometry as well as photo photometry and spectroscopy of stars of our galaxy. So, Gaia will cover about a million stars. Sorry, a billion stars. Uh, uh, of our galaxy and give us six dimensional data of this of these stars. So in this tutorial I'd like to show you an example of how you can use star Gaia data to study star clusters and uh, uh, do some basic queries with the astronomical data query language and get Gaia parameters for the closest stars. Now star clusters basically stars are formed in groups and they so they are formed so they are star clusters made up of stars which are at the same distance of the same chemical composition on the same molecular cloud and uh, the only difference in principle is their difference in mass but obviously since they are made up from the same molecular cloud they all move from us in the same velocity and therefore if we could measure their velocities uh, they'd all be moving together so if you look at these groups of stars this is what is called a globular cluster. This is typically found in the halo of our galaxy, a large number of stars, say about 10,000 or even more stars. And uh, there are open clusters, which are also groups of stars of more looser groups of stars, lesser number of stars, which are basically found in the disk of our galaxy. Now globulars are essentially much older objects. They have an age of about a billion years, which is 10 power nine, while open clusters have ages of millions of years, which is 10 power six. Now, uh, <clears throat> so typically here you can see the difference in globulars and, and open star clusters. Like I mentioned, globular star clusters are older clusters and uh, they are found in the halo of the galaxy. Open clusters are younger, found in the disk of the galaxy. But obviously in both cases, since they are formed from the same molecular cloud, they will have the same velocities. And uh, I'm going to show you how we could identify members of these objects using Gaia data. Now, Gaia, like I mentioned to you, is a space observatory which was of, of ESA, which was launched in 2013. It will continue to operate easily till 2025. And it's basically designed to very accurately measure the positions of stars for which measurements from space are very essential. The distance to them using what is called parallax so uh, parallax is such that one upon parallax in principle gives you the distance to stars and the motions of these stars by what is called proper motion and what is called radial velocities. So you have astrometry, photometry, and spectroscopy for more than a billion stars. So Gaia data, if you actually access Gaia data, the first two parameters you get is right ascension and declination. These are the, the positions of stars which are equivalent to longitudes and latitudes of stars, which can actually tell you the positions of stars in the celestial frame of reference. So this is the celestial frame of reference. The red line is the ecliptic, this is the equator, and you can actually have the position of stars. You can read more details about RAs and decks in this reference given below. The other point which you're getting about stars is their parallax, which I tell you, which is the apparent shift in the position of stars with, uh, with uh, reference to a background, sorry, this is reference to a background, when observed from different points. So Gaia has been constantly measuring the position of stars 
and uh, the shift will give you the distance, which is one upon parallax. The radial velocity is the velocity of the object along the line of sight, and uh, <coughs> that is the radial velocity. And this is what we get from spectroscopy. So on the Gaia satellite, there's also a spectrograph, which is a radial velocity spectrograph, which gives us those first The other two quantities which we get from Gaia is what is called the proper motion. That is, you actually look for the angular drift of the star in the plane of sky, and it is so, which is called the proper motion. And the proper motion is a result in both the components, the RA and the deck, to actually uh, see its data. Now, Gaia has been releasing its data in various Gaia releases. There was a data release one, data release two, there's been an early data release three, and uh, sorry, I should have edited it over here, but the latest data release is the data release three, which was released on the 13th of June, very recently, and that's the most recent data release. Now, the archive data is the repository or the remote server where you can actually access get data from the archive and use it. So the first thing I'm going to show to you is how can you actually search the basic data which you have over here. So uh, I've already shared this um, file with you all. So if you run it over here, this will actually give you uh, access to the actual site from which you can query the Gaia data. And uh, let us say we do the query for this object, which is Messier 45, which is the Pleiades. And uh, if you run this thing, you'll actually you go to the search window, click on this, and here is the Gaia search. You can give the name of your object. For example, if I say it's Pleiades, which is M45, I can target it in a search radius, which is with a circle or a box as I wish. And here I can increase the size in which I'm actually looking for it. So for example, if I, um, I hope you're aware that um, angular positions are measured in degrees and uh, you can resolve it further into arc minutes, where 60 arc minutes is a degree, or 60 arc seconds is an arc minute. So let's say I'm gonna query it, for example, in arc minutes, and let's say I'm gonna query 20 arc minutes, which I have described over here. So let's say we, um, we are gonna query it in 20 arc minutes, okay. And uh, here you can actually search it in the repository. You can see that there are various sources over here that you can query. And I'm going to query the Gaia DR3 data source, which is listed over here. You can accordingly also, did, you know, access various other sources. For example, the DR2, the data release 2, and various other sources which could be of interest. You can apply conditions to the sources, the listings, and you can also decide which columns would you like to display, right? So you have a whole bunch of display columns which are listed over here. For example, I can do the RA, I can do the, the deck, I can look for the source ID, the proper motion and deck, the proper motion and RA. I can also look for quantities like is it the quantity called the RUWE, which is not just now of interest, but could be of interest. The BP minus RP, which is the colors in photometry. The, um, so here you could look for the G magnitude, which is the brightness in a certain filter, which is the G magnitude over here. And uh, you could have the parallax. So you can actually use the check boxes. This is the G magnitude, the radial velocity. You can use the boxes to actually query the data. You can also give you things like whether it's a non-signal star or epoch, whatever. We won't go into these details, but these are further details about the parameters which you could be interested in. With this, you can submit a query, right? And once you submit the query, it's going to give you results. So here are the results of the query which you have. If I want to download the query, I can download it in various formats. It's a format called the VO table format. But today we look at the simple, simpler format, which is the CSV format, which means the comma separated variables format. And if you click on this, you can download the results, right? Onto your data list. I'm not going to be downloading it because I've already done that and I can save my time. Now we are using a Jupyter notebook to query this. And for this, we need certain files, certain uh, libraries, which we are going to list over here. So you can run this and I'm importing this. This is NumPy and I'm importing pandas as pd. We've already gone through these things in the last tutorial, numpy and pandas. 
and matplotlib, which is the basic plotting package in um, Python. I can also use these things, which actually we do not use. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I've mentioned this, this, but we actually do not need to use this. You can also in, in install what is called Asta Query, which we will need for our thing. So if you don't have it with you, you will pip install it and uh, you can actually run it. And here now when I run Astro Query, in Astro Query, I need certain uh, <coughs> units, I mean certain uh, modules which are there in this, which is coordinates, Gaia and Vizier. So I'll run these over here. And now here you can see, other than the query which I showed you earlier, I'm now showing you how can you use Astro Query to actually query data. In this case here, if you, you can actually query it using this thing, which is showing you <coughs> it using the coordinate package. And I'm looking for this object M45. And here is J where I do a cold search. Look for this, download the coordinates, the radius from the table called the idea three source. And I get the results. So I can run this thing. And this is actually querying. So now in R, you can actually get your results. I can type R and I can look at R over here. R, R is actually giving me my source ID, my various parameters for this thing, the RA, the RA deck, uh, RA error, the deck, the deck error, etc. These are all being queried by me, by this previous query. If you want to look at any other object, you can give its name over here and it will query it accordingly. When I'm putting U deck by divide by three, this means 60 degrees divide by three, which is 20 arc minutes, because one degree is 60, so 60 divided by three is 20. So I'm querying a radius of 20 arc minutes around the source. Right. Now, uh, <clears throat> the other way out is if you downloaded the data, which I have done, you can actually read the CSV file as a pandas data free, and you can get that, which is M45, PD read this thing, which is this. And I can use this to actually look at my, this is the, the downloaded data. I can use it in either way, right? So I've shown you how to query the data. Either you can query it using this thing, which is a more a uh, user-friendly method of doing it using the DESA archive, as well as I've even showed you how could you query it using the cone search around M45. Now, once you do this, you can actually plot these. Uh, <clears throat> so here I'm showing you a basic sky plot for M45. So here you can see the M45 data. I'm plotting it for RA versus DEC, and you can see the sky plot of M45 data over here which is plotted in this case. <clears throat> now in astronomy, we use what is called the HR diagram, which is basically a plot of magnitude versus color. So here what I use, the magnitude I use is the G band magnitude versus the color, which is BP minus RP. So if I actually use this, I use, I've used Seaborn and not Matplotlib, which is, which is SNS. And uh, Seaborn is just a little neater with plotting compared to black plot lip, but in principle, you can use either of the two. So if I use Seaborn, I can actually run this and I can look at the plot which I get, which I've just shown it to you. And uh, so this is the HR diagram. But if you look at this HR diagram or the color magnitude diagram for M45, you can see that there's a lot of contamination in this HR diagram because this is basically plotting all the stars in that region. So what I'm going to now do is I'm going to try to identify members of that cluster using the basic information we know that members of the cluster should be at the same distance and they should have the same velocities, right? So here what I'm doing is I'm plotting the proper motions in RA and DEC for the whole region of the sky. And if I plot this thing, you can see this plot, which is the proper motion in RA versus proper motion in DEC you can see that there are two blobs you get. You see this blob is centered at 0, 0, and there's another blob which is centered at another location. Now the 0, 0 blob is basically the stars which are all the stars of their region. So you can see randomly if I were to pick up any region of the sky, you would see a center close to 0, 0, and stars would have, you know, uh, velocities distributed around that. So therefore these stars are not of interest to us these are the random stars or the field stars in that region. The stars that are of interest to us are these stars, which have a clear proper motion 
which is different from the one centered at zero zero. And therefore, these stars are the cluster stars which we are interested in, which are centered somewhere around a uh, proper motion RA of 20, and this is about minus 45, right? So these are the cluster stars which we are interested in. So what I'm going to do is I am basically going to look at stars around this area. The other thing is we are also going to plot the proper motion versus the parallax. The parallax, like I told you, an estimate of distance. Again, when I plot this, you can see proper motion around RA is distributed for a large range of parallax, which is seen over here. While the proper motion around 20, which you saw was the, the distance with the proper motion for the cluster, is with a certain parallax over here, which is something close to seven, right? Which is these stars. And once again, these are the stars which interest us, which are the stars of the cluster. While these stars are clusters of the field, which actually do not interest us. So we basically want to look at these stars. I can do a similar plot with proper motion and deck, where again, when I do proper motion and deck, you can see the ones centered around, around zero have a large range of parallax, but the one centered around minus 50 has this kind of a parallax, which is again the cluster stars we are interested in. If I also plot a histogram plot, I can actually see that there's a large amount of stars which are uh, you know, centered around this parallax. So there's a smaller set around this, and again, these are the cluster stars we are looking for. I can also do what is called a KDE distribution, which is a kernel density estimation, which will show me the kernel density estimation for this, with which I can find out the peak, which is there for the cluster stars. I've similarly just, for, just done one with proper motion in RA, as well as proper motion in DEC, so I can identify exactly the values. And I can do this. Now what I'm doing is I'm actually identifying my, my members by putting a mask. So I'm looking for, I've taken a range, you can see the parallax range I've taken is 6 to 8.5. So if we look at our parallax histogram, I'm taking something between 6 to 8.5 for the cluster. Similarly, I'm identifying a mask for proper motion, which I'm taking it between 10 and 30. So the proper motion in RA, I've taken it something between 10 and 30. And the proper motion in DEC, I've taken it something between minus 50 and minus 40, which is this range, the proper motion in DEC. Okay, this is the proper motion RA and the proper motion. I'm sorry, yeah. So here is the thing, minus 40 to minus 50. And while I put these masks, I'm basically identifying the members of this cluster. So I've, I've put these masks, and with this mask, I actually identify the members, right? And the members are the stars which actually satisfy the mask. And therefore, what I'm doing is now I have actually identified members, and here you can see is I have actually got the mean RA, the mean deck for these members. The mean parallax, you can see over here, is 7.36 with this error. And I have my other values, which are also centered around here. And <clears throat> so I get these things. I get the members. I have this. And now, if you see, if I plot my color magnitude diagram, which is the color magnitude diagram for the cluster, you can see the blue stars were all the stars of that region, while um, the orange stars is the specific stars, which are the ones which satisfy the mask, okay? And the mask was identified by me by actually looking for the distributions in parallax, in proper motion in RA, as well as in proper motion in DEC, for me to identify or create cutoffs for the member stars for our cluster, right? So what we have done is we have successfully identified the members of our cluster, right? So <clears throat> that is shown to you over here. And now what we have, this is what we call a clean color magnitude diagram. That is a diagram in which we have the members, right? Which are these orange stars. I can show you the, the one which is plotting only members, which is this. We still have these stars, which are contaminants which are stars which satisfy these conditions because you can have stars in that region of the sky 
which are at the same distance, which are not members. And similarly, you can have stars in that region of the sky, which have similar velocities, which are also not members. And therefore, these stars, the ones below the, the this color magnitude to the HR, these are most probably contaminants, which do not belong to the cluster. But these stars are the ones which are obviously members, most probably members. So <clears throat> we have done that and we have identified our members. Now for astronomy, um, these were two ways in which you could query the data, but there is also a query language which has been specifically designed to query um, astronomy data. And this is basically based on what is called SQL, which is a query language, but it has been fine tuned. Now SQL has a syntax something like this, and uh, which, which can be, um, so what you, if you actually go into this earlier thing which I showed you, in this query, you can actually query using the query language. So I can actually, if I, this was the query, I can actually see the query, I can, you know, look at this thing in the query language, and I can actually use this query language in the same form, and I can identify sources. So if you do a basic query, you can actually, you can press this thing called show query, which actually shows the same query in ADQL, right? So you can use the basic search, use that, and use the query language, see this over here, and get some sample queries. And in that way, you can see how to use the query language, which I'll show it to you in a minute. And here, <clears throat> it's a little cryptic, but it's not very difficult. For example, if you want to select the 100 closest stars to the Earth, you can select top 100, right? This is the syntax from, this is for the earlier Gaia DR2. You are selecting it from this database where the Gaia parallax is greater than zero. You will see that for the stars, you can have negative parallaxes, but we are specifically selecting stars which have parallax greater than zero. We ask it to actually query it by the parallax in descending order because we know that one upon parallax is the distance and therefore um, the ones with the, uh, if I want to have the closest stars, I will need to query it in that way. So I'm sorting that in that sense. So my query will look something like this. Select top 100 from this thing, which actually has these uh, parallax is greater than zero order by this, and I can do it like that. So you can put this uh, ADQL query in the, in that window which I'd shown you earlier, and you can do this. So you can actually, if you want the closest this thing, you can query it and you can download the data like I showed you in that case. So for example, over here, I have an example where I have tried to uh, query that thing. And uh, this is the, the query, uh, the, the result of the query. And you can actually display the thing, see the head of the file and you can get this over here, right? So in this way, uh, you can, well, there are many ways in which you can actually uh, query the Gaia database. Like I mentioned, uh, I showed you in the beginning, there was the basic query, which is, you know, you don't have to know any commands. You can actually do it menu driven and uh, query the data and do things with the, with the query thing. You can also query it using the AstroPy uh, query, which I showed you, the Gaia query. And you can also query using the ADQL language. So any of the query languages can be used by you. And uh, I hope I hope this was clear. I am now just gonna show you some uh, two, three assignments, two assignments which I have put for you. One is that you could actually work with the ADQL language. And actually, if you do not have any experience with it, you can, um, you know, you did it for the closest 100 stars. I would request you, okay, so this I should change it to the Gaia DR3 database. This is an older thing. Let's move this to the Gaia data DR3. Get Gaia parameters with the closest 10,000 stars. Write the ADQL query and try to plot it and look at that. So that would be the first assignment for you, which would be with the ADQL query. And the other assignment which I would give you is that like the, I showed you the HR diagram for uh, M45, which is Pleiades. The closest cluster to us. Uh, if you remember, we had got the mean parallax to be 7.25. You can actually get the distance to Pleiades using um, 
one upon that. And similarly, I, I want you to find the HR diagram for three clusters, which is NGC 1893, M4, and NGC 581. Look at the similarities and the differences in the HR diagrams, as well as find the distances, because you are going to get the parallax. Using the mean parallax, you can actually find the distances to each of these clusters and uh, look at their HR diagrams. So thank you. I'll stop with that. I think I was a bit too far. I mean, is that? I think I overshot. Sorry. Don't worry about that. Thank you so much, Priya. It's always good to see the good old playlist cluster. All right, uh, let's move on to our next speaker, Shitan, who will tell us about the NASA Exoplanet Archive. Yep, uh, can you guys, uh, Sophie, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, can you see my screen? Okay. So, hi everyone. Uh, I'll be talking about NASA Exoplanet Ar Archive, and I'll be like going through how to use the archive, just like uh, Dr. Priya did. With Gaia, we'll have some uh, data that we download from the archive and we'll plot it on the Python so that we can do some science with it. So first of all, like what is NASA planet uh, exoplanet archive? And then uh, let's see an example of the mass radius diagram using our downloaded data set. And then we'll be visualize the radius distribution of transiting exoplanets discovered specifically by Kepler since a large fraction of transiting exoplanets source uh, like searched by Kepler itself. And then we have some short assignments based on this data itself. So first of all, let's jump to Exoplanet Archive. So if you don't, don't have the link, you can open it using okay. the notebook that is here. Uh, I have also opened it by myself. So this is NASA Exoplanet Archive. And this host, this is a place where uh, the published planets and their characteristics or you know you can say parameters are hosted in a format that is easy for us to use like in a tab tabular format and there are a bunch of tools that the exoplanet archive uh, gives us to you know visualize and uh, do stuff with this data and there is also a bunch of data that is present in different tables that we can use so today we'll be using this planetary systems data um, and specifically for confirmed planets. But before that, let's go ahead and like search for just one planet using this search window that is given on the archive. So let's say that I am going to search a planetary system, AUMIC, which is one of my favorite systems. It's a very young star and it has two published candidate planets around it. So if we just give the name of the uh, system on this search, you can see like it will open up a window that that has all the parameters. So I have already opened it since it takes a bit of time. So this is the AUMIC system. There are two planets, AUMIC B and AUMIC C. So by now, I guess you just as you all have already should have already read the paper in the last week. You must know that planet exoplanets are just planets around stars other than the sun. So A, U, M, B, and C, this is the naming convention where we name planets in the order that we detect them. So, and we start with the small letter B. So A, U, M, B is the first planet detected around this star that is A, U, M, and C is the next planet that we detected. And over here, you can see the discovery data of these planets. So this has like the method of how the, these were discovered, the year these were discovered in and then the reference and this is all this also points to a paper that the, the original paper that uh, detected this planet so you can also read through it if you want to and then it tells us like if this is a confirmed planet uh, or maybe a candidate planet like it's still in the process of confirming and then it gives some more data so this is the AUMX stellar parameter so the parameters of the star and we have a bunch of parameters here again RA and DEC again tells us the position of the star in the sky as Dr. Priya just talked about. And then we have the distance from Earth, some uh, like the parallax and so on. We have a lot of parameters that we can use to look at this uh, particular star. And these are from different sources. So we're, like these are the papers that discusses these uh, parameters for these stars or characterizes these stars. And similarly for planets and these are different papers that are uh, you know discover this planet and characterize this planet and this one is the first 
one that discovered it and has these set of parameters and then it should like ideally improve over time so you can uh, fetch these uh, data so you can see like there are some data that are useful for our uh, transit search as well so after so we have this semi major access if you just hover over it you'll get a brief description of what the column is supposed to be so rp over r star is just the radius of planet as compared to the radius of the star and so on so this is very useful when you are searching for or when you are researching just one planetary system let's say aomic which again as i said is a very young uh, stellar system or a, a planetary system and when you are like looking at multiple stars you can just go into the data column over here and you can uh, let's say like i'm i'm about to search for a 100 planets so i'll go into this planetary systems data and this will open up in a tab tabular format again um let's wait for a second yep yeah. so this is kind of a interface in which it presents data to us and even before it retrieves the data you can see like there are some tabs over here that we can use and this is the data in the tabular format as i was saying this is the planet name we have the host name which is the star's name and then the number of stars in the in the system the number of planets that those star hosts the discovery method here and facility like we are going to filter on it in the later section uh, for like kepler and then we have some more parameters about the planets itself so planetary mass in earth masses and planetary radius in earth radius eccentricity and so on so what we are going to do is we are going to use this data and again uh, as we query data in gaia we also just download data from here based on a set of conditions that we can place on these uh, check uh, you know in in these input fields which are just filters so if you if you if we were to say like i'm only looking for planets that are detected by transit method i'll just put in transit over here and press enter this should filter the complete set of data that was like 32000 uh, rows over here earlier and it will it will be like now 29000 something rows that were detected using transit methods so uh, if you were wondering like there are only 5000 published uh, and confirmed planets you can see like there are multiple entries for the same planet and these are because these are planetary parameters that are characterized by different people over different papers so there there might be multiple entries that is why the number is so huge and then let's do some more uh, filters and if you can see on uh, over here there is a question mark and if you can if you click on it it helps us in how to filter data we can remove nulls and we can have uh, you know some string matches that we just did like we placed transit and it showed us all the results that had transits we can also exclude some strings like let's say that i want to search from all planets that were not detected by transit so i can write like not like transits and so on so we'll we'll come back to this and uh, we'll download some data what what are the what is the data that we are downloading i'll just talk about that in a minute so um first of all in the notebook uh, we'll have the commands to like get our uh, libraries so we'll have the os for like file directory handling so this will be used for folders and stuff we have pandas and numpy and matplotlib that you already uh, should know from the last tutorials and then we'll be doing this zeroth exercise first so we'll be downloading a sample of exoplanet subject to some constraints constraints these are just uh, you know uh, constraints that we are putting through these filters so first of all we are going to exoplanet archive and we are going to confirm planets which we did second is we'll have to add columns so that we have planetary mass and radius in terms of in units of earth mass and earth radius so let's see if we have this over here so i can already see i have planet radius and earth radius and i have planetary mass and earth masses so we have these two um uh, you know columns in our data if 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 they, they were weren't here we can also select columns from over here so you can see like there are some selected columns already but there are also a lot of unselected columns that we can check box uh, so if I, i were to say like i'll have to see the inclination 
in degrees based on how the planet is located in the line of sight for Earth. I'll have to just check this column and it will appear over here. And then uh, let's go to the next point. So we have the columns and we need the constraints. So what are the constraints? First is these need to be discovered by Kepler via the transit method. And we'll have to make sure that we exclude any rows that have null radius measurements because we are going to use this radius measurements and we do not want any nulls in our data. So we have our first filter already in. We can write over here, discover facility as Kepler. If I were just to remove these, uh, this filter, I'll just delete the whole thing and press enter and it will remove the filter as well. So we have uh, narrowed down a bit. Now you can see like we also have some other candidate planets over here. So let's write that we need published and confirmed planets. So this will also filter down the data a bit. And in the last part, we'll have only stars that have non-null non radius. So in the planet radius, if you just press on this idea, you can see we can have this not null condition. So I'll just write not null. And on the bottom, you can see we have 6,500 and 65 stars or 65 planets now, or these are the number of records we have. So to download this data, we can go over here. We'll again use the comma separated values format, which is an easy format to use. All the values are just separated by commas. And we'll be downloading the currently checked columns and the filtered rows. So we'll just download the table. I've already downloaded it, so let's not download it again. And it is present in the data folder. Um, if you like just see over here in the week three, you can see in the data, there is this Kepler data. You'll have to refer to this. And you can also go and take a look at how the data is formatted. So on the top, you can see like some comments. Uh, all of these comments are starting with a hashtag. So, so that we know that these are comments and not the data itself. And there are the constraints that we uh, typed in just now using the filters and the columns and the descriptions as well. So if you want to see like what a column specifically means, you can see it over in the file that you just downloaded. It can open with Excel or even, a, even in a text editor. And then there's the actual data. So let's just read this in uh, into Python. So first of all, I'm just reading it in just giving it a data path and reading it using pandas read csv method and i'm specifying that the comments are specified using this hashtag so that i do not read those comments uh, i'll use the head command to just see the five top five rows so you can see we have the data already and we have some columns that have a specific syntax of the column name um the pl read that E basically means the planet radius in our radius units. So you can see there are no null or any N values. Any N simply means not a number. And if I were to just see how many rows and columns I have, so I have 6,565 rows, which is what we just filtered out. And I have 92 columns. And then I'm trying to just plot, a, plot the data. And first I'll make a quick mass radius diagram. So what I mean by quick is just I'll put the mass and the radius and just plot it. So you can see all of this is, you know, uh, clamped up in the beginning. So what I can do is use a log space instead that will have our, uh, you know, this uh, spacing correctly. So what I am doing here is again plotting the same thing. Uh, this dot says that every planet should be represented by a small dot in the plot and then alpha just says that this should be the transparency of the dots so that we can see the dots that are behind each other. And I'm just plotting some labels in X and Y axis, uh, also printing the number of planets over here and just putting the X and Y scale as logarithmic. And we can see like this is the data that we got. We have a mass radius distribution of the planets that we had. So first, first was this. The second is I'm just going to visualize the distribution of how these uh, planets are distributed using histograms. So uh, if I were just to like plot his, uh, the histogram of radius, you can see this is this is the distribution that we get. And again, 
this n on the y-axis is just the number of planets and radius on the x-axis and again you can see like this is cramped up in the beginning so we'll just put the x scale as log scale and also this is not really helpful since all of the planets are present in just one bin bin is basically saying that all of the planets are grouped together so we'll uh, have some new bins we'll we'll create some bins based on these log spacing since we know that logarithmic works better over here and we'll plot this so we have this x scale as log and we can see we have something better we can we can at least see how the radius is being distributed around the planets that we uh, you know uh, downloaded just now and you can also see some uh, you know observations in this data so first is we see a peak over here in the in the planet's radius so the planet uh, radius are you know uh, till something like one it, there are a lot of planets in this radius but in this over here you can see like there is a gap or you know the density drops over here and then it uh, increases again so this is kind of a bimodal uh, you know behavior of how the planets are distributed so i'm just zooming into this bit and I am using this x limit, so I am saying that look at planets between one Earth radi radius that is equal to one Earth radii and five Earth radii, and you can now clearly see this is a bimodal distribution. So this is called a radius gap, or you know, this is also called the radius valley of exoplanets or the Fulton gap. Um, and the assignments that you are supposed to do are built on this as well so first is you can you i have posted a link of a small blog over here and we'll also have a paper uh, this week so you'll read read about it in more detail anyway but uh, read this blog and see wh what are the two prevalent reasons for this gap that we see in the exoplanets and we can also do a bunch of things so we'll plot you can plot orbital radius versus orbital period versus radius for transiting Kepler planets that we just downloaded. So the same data, just try to plot orbital period versus radius and, you know, write what your um, observations are over here. And you can also make your own plot of any two parameters in the data. Try downloading a new set of data, try making new constraints and stuff like that using getting new uh, columns and also explain why you did so so you can be creative in this and i have also posted a link on piazza you can post your plots or and your explanations for this fifth point over there so that all the students and all the participants can you know pool their knowledge of why they are choosing some particular set of columns and what was their rationale behind this so this would be all thank you so much Thank you so much, Shitan. Uh, it was definitely fantastic. Uh, let's see, our next speaker is Jack. Tell us about the Proxima Centauri system. All right. Hello, everyone. Hey, Jack. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about Proxima Centauri. I'm going to share my screen, uh, which has the paper up for this week. Um, this week's paper is, is not a, a full, like, academic journal paper. It's more of like a, um, a summary paper, so a popular science summary. Um, but I, uh, we think these are also really important to, to know how to read and you know how to interpret some of the things that are often written in popular science uh, summaries of academic work. Um, because just as important as the research itself is the communication of that research. Um, and and you can do research that says one thing, and if uh, if um, you go to communicate that to the world, either directly <laughs> yourself or through a, a publication um, of some sort, and maybe you're talking to a reporter, um, we want to make sure that our science can be accurately conveyed not only to the second party but then out into the world, um, so that everyone can can enjoy it. Um, and so. This, um, this update is about a new planet orbiting Proxima Centauri b, which is very exciting because Proxima Centauri is the uh, nearest planet, nearest, sorry, the nearest star to our own sun. Um, and so to have a planet orbiting that star is very exciting. Uh, conceivably, it would be the easiest uh, to travel to one day, uh, given that it is our closest next door neighbor. 
Um, although be, despite being the closest, it is still over four light years away. So it would take still a very, very long time uh, to get there, but still exciting nonetheless. Um, and so before I get too deep into this, I do wanna uh, say that the, this, pa this um, popular science article is based on uh, an academic article titled a terrestrial planet candidate in a temperate orbit around Proxima Centauri. Uh, this is uh, the ADS link to that uh, paper. And I've also just previously pulled up the, um, the PDF to that paper. Um, if there's time, maybe we'll scroll through, but, but perhaps not. Uh, but I did want to link to the original, uh, the original science work and credit the original authors here. Um, but so this article opens with um, a really exciting statement that we found a planet uh, in, in the star system nearest to our own. And it makes this um, really cool claim that the planet is in the star's habitable zone, meaning that liquid water could exist on the planet's surface, which has raised the prospects for harboring life. Um, this is something that comes up a lot in popular science articles about astronomy, particularly about exoplanets, um, because we are all interested in, in finding life uh, potentially on other, on other planets or on other stars. Um, and so when we do find a planet that we think you know, might have some of the characteristics similar to Earth, we get very excited over it, and it's usually highlighted in these types of articles. Um, one thing that I think, though, is important to remember is that just because a star is, uh, sorry, a planet is in its star's habitable zone, that only means that liquid water could exist on the surface. It doesn't mean that the planet is habited, inhabited. It doesn't mean that liquid water does exist on the surface. It only means that the temperature ranges uh, on the planet, given its distance from its host star, is such that liquid water could exist on the surface. Um, that doesn't mean that if a planet is outside of the habitable zone, that liquid water can't exist on the surface. It just means that there would need to be more uh, a more kind of unique environment uh, on that planet um, to allow for liquid water to exist on on the surface. Um, so. What a lot of astronomers like to say is that the habitable zone is a really good uh, first look at a planet in, in terms of, of if it might be Earth-like, um, but it's not the only metric for determining if a planet could host life, or, or certainly if it does. As of now, we don't know of any planets that host life, um, but we do know of a few planets that we think might be very similar to Earth and therefore could have life on those planets. Um, but some other interesting things about this planet um, it is very similar to Earth in its size. It's only 1.3 times larger than Earth. So that's very neat. Uh, so about the same size. Uh, however, it goes around its star in only 11 days. So we go around our star in 365. This star does it in only 11. So their, their year would only be 11 days long. Um, and that's, that's really quick. Um, but, uh, but exciting and actually is probably one of the reasons we were able to detect it. The closer a planet is to its host star, the easier it is for us to detect it, depending on the um, detection method we're using. Um, but because the star is so close to our own, uh, a lot of people have been very excited about this and, and <laughs> want to use the fact that it's so close to us to try to do types of experiments that we might not otherwise be able to do. Uh, we wanna use that closeness to our advantage and so Later in this article, I'm gonna scroll down a bit, although actually let's admire this nice artist rendering first of what the planet might look like. I always love these, these artist renderings, uh, imagining what these planets could look like and, and their host stars. Uh, what's neat about this one is that, so of course here's the planet, here's the host star Proxima Centauri. But Proxima Centauri itself, as the article states a little above, is part of a triple star system. And way out here in the distance, you can see the other two stars. Um, so I really like this artist rendering. Um, but as I was saying, they want to use the, the closeness of the system, the closeness to our own Earth, as a way to do experiments that we might not know, otherwise be able to do. And so in particular, um, there's this one experiment they want to do, scrolling to this section called Ast Astronomical Answers. Um, they want to try to look for um, the reflected light of the planet from the star. So, so we look at a star, it's very, very bright, but, uh, but the planet next to it should be reflecting some of that starlight. Uh, and so in theory, we should be able to see some of that reflected starlight. The, the trick is that the reflected light is so much small, so much less bright than the star itself, that it's very, it's impossible to see without doing some 
um, some tricks, if you will, um, to 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 block out some of the host star's light in order to see some of the reflected planet's light. And so these astronomers um, uh, at uh, institutions where their names, um, here's one, Ignaz Snellen of University of Leiden in the Netherlands, and uh, Lovis, which is, he is referenced earlier, I can't remember where, sorry, but uh, they've come up with an experiment to um, basically pass the starlight through one instrument, the spectropolarimic high contrast exoplanet research instrument, which they call sphere. They're going to pass the image of the star through this first in order to correct for the turbulence of the atmosphere, uh, which blurs the images. But and, and so this makes a much clearer picture uh, to begin with. So we can take a, a star that's 10 million times, or sorry, the planet is 10 million times fainter than the star. But by first passing it through this instrument, we can get that down to only a thousand times fainter. And he jokes that saying it's still a thousand times, but it's much better. Um, and then we can pass that light into a second uh, instrument, which is called Espresso, the shell spectrograph for rocky exoplanet and stable spectroscopic observations. Uh, and from here, they can watch the stellar spectrum change as the planet orbits the star. Um, and, and this is, again, something that, that is not easy to do by any means, but is easier to do because of the closeness of the system to our own. So this is a really neat experiment. Uh, one thing about this article you might notice is that it was written uh, at this point almost five years ago. Actually, exactly five years ago from today. That's kind of spooky. Did we plan that day? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Not really. But uh, yeah. But what's interesting is that they say at the end of this sentence, uh, this paragraph, is that they're hoping to do this experiment in the next three to five years. So I I'm personally not aware of it having been done. I don't know about you, Faye, but um, I, I haven't heard anything. So maybe they've just wrapped up observations and now they need you know some time to write it up and process it. But um, uh, that's something we can all check on and, and uh, kind of keep at the forefront of our mind in, in the next year or two, maybe. Um, so, you know, everyone always says, oh, three to five years or in the next five to 10 years, scientists are not very good at making predictions on how long it will take to Perform their experiment. So, uh, no, nothing wrong with taking longer than what you originally suspect. But we do hope that they will do this experiment because it'll be really, really cool. Um, but so I, I do want to wrap up because I, I think I'm getting close to over time. But this is a really interesting article. Article I really uh, emphasize that if you have the time to, to read through the whole thing and, and learn about some of the science that you can do on this really nearby and interesting planet system, um, and um, and just kind of keep keep this system in your mind because a lot of science is, is has happened and will happen uh, with respect to the system because it's so exciting. And the last thing I'll say is that since this article was published in uh, 2016, remember the original science article was published September of 2016, there's actually been two more planets found in the system, Proxima C and Proxima D. And those are also interesting planets in their own right. Um, and so this is just a really fascinating planet system right in our backyard, essentially. Um, and so with that, I'll, I'll wrap it up and, and send it back to Faye. Thank you so much, Jack. Right, uh, final speaker today is Maria. She's gonna tell us about her life story of how she ended up as a young astronomer. Or is yours, Maria? Oh, okay. Um, I did make a little slideshow of that just, so, just because then it's easier to like to show the points it's like if I'm not super audible or anything. So, and I really hope I don't go over time. Okay. So, as you may know, my name is Maria. I am currently a graduate student at the Institute for Astronomy and I just finished my first year. And so uh, my, my story as to how I became an astronomer, how I ended up where I am, it's not super extraordinary. It's pretty much close to a traditional story, but still I thought it was worth sharing it so that you have an idea about how to approach your dream career or um, what are the steps you probably have to take at a certain, well, wherever you are. If you're a first year undergrad or a senior year or a fourth year undergrad, what should your next steps look like? So um, I started my undergrad in uh, fall of 2016, that's uh, September of 2016. I was I started off as a geophysics major at UCLA. However, in the following term, in January 2017, I thought, why not add a second major? 
So I always considered doing astrophysics. I wasn't sure what I really wanted until, un, until I learned about planetary science as a field of research. So for those of you not familiar, planetary science is just, is the subsection of astronomy, maybe a little bit of geology, where you learn more about solid bodies and their processes and what governs their physics and chemistry and all of that. It is a field of its own, but also very well falls within astronomy. And so in 27, and so in that term, I decided to add that major and I started taking the extra classes I needed for it. And the following summer, I did an internship as an uh, internship and work as a lab assistant. So as you may know, my internship was not research related at all, which is one important thing I need to drive at this point. Um, it is non mandatory that whenever you're applying, when you're applying to grad school, or when you're applying to a research based career, everything you do as an undergrad should has to be research based. Sometimes you pick up the skills that you need from somewhere totally different. So I interned for a science publication. I was basically working on looking for new stories to talk about, people to interview, and I was also helping them plan this uh, event that was supposed to happen, but got canceled because of COVID. Um, so I guess one of the most important skills you need as a scientist is you need to know how to communicate your science, how to have your feelers out for upcoming popular people, Networking is important. I actually started getting those skills from this internship, which had absolutely nothing to do with science, real research like I'm doing today. And then that was like a month. And then I did this, uh, this um, sort of lab, I did this assistant thing where I worked with um, a lab at UCLA, uh, which did meteorite analysis. So I learned how sample preparation works. I learned to operate a secondary electron microscope. I learned BSC imaging, BSC stands for backscattered electron imaging. Uh, if you're interested, you should look it up or you could talk to me and I can tell you more about it. Um, and that was my first, state, first taste of how scientific research is actually done, what it means how um, the university lab works, the whole team di teamwork dynamics, how research is done as a group and how people operate instruments, especially, you know, you have this one instrument and everybody in that field of research uses that instrument in your university, how, how that works, the little, you know, the little subtext, probably not significant, but very important details that is a part of research. I actually picked it up from this uh, lab assistant position. And then the following term, I had, so this was 17 summer, and then um, fall of 2017, I just took a break. And then the next term in January, 2018, I took a term off from school and I went to do a project at this uh, facility in India, which comes under the government. Um, so a lot of people don't take a term off from school, but some of us do. Sometimes people take a term off from school because, um, you know, maybe they have, maybe they get an internship or a job opportunity like I did, or maybe because they just have some personal things to deal with and they want to take a break from school because you're not, because it doesn't feel good. And honestly, that is totally okay. If you do have an option, I know, I understand there are a lot of people from different countries, different educational backgrounds over here, so it's not always possible. But if you feel like you don't belong and you need you need a break, it, please please uh, be aware it is totally okay to take a break. And if you feel like you can do something more productive during that break, that is all the more better. So this was my first real project, and it was a very very good experience. In fact, it was a landmark experience in my undergraduate career because that get, helped me get more research positions down the line. It helped me build a portfolio. It gave put me in touch with a lot of amazing scientists and students, all of who are just, well, they uh, who are like now in the final year of their PhD or just finished their PhD in our postdocs. Um, I gained some useful skills in scientific research. I also got to participate in some outreach events. All in all, it was a great experience. And I was so glad I took that term off. And then the following summer, I got a research grant uh, from my department and I did, and I picked up the work I did as a lab assistant and made that into an actual project where I was doing x-ray mapping of meteorites to look for carbonates, which is important because carbonates are thought to be these water bearing minerals. Um, and, and that was, that lasted an entire term and my summer term as well, which is super useful because out of it, I got to eventually present that research and the research I did in the previous term as a poster in under various undergraduate poster sessions. Uh, so one important aspect of doing science is you just don't ask a question or look for a solution, but you also communicate your results. 
a lot of people do it through talks, through seminars, and for undergrad, for undergrads and even stu graduate students in general or early career scientists, research posters are very, very important. Uh, you get to present this really nice, beautiful graph, a big graphic with all your, um, with your, you know, your uh, experiments, your or whatever models you created, your con results, conclusions, and you get to present it to a lot of people who may or may not be aware of your of your particular subfield. Uh, it is a great way to connect with um, your peers at similar stages of a career, or more advanced or more junior to you, and you can learn a lot from them. You can learn a lot about what else is going on in your field, and. It is a very useful and learning how to present your science is a very, very useful skill. And it's very important too, because if you don't know how to communicate your science, you're not able, you won't be able to get the exposure that you need. You probably won't be able to, you know, get a good job or get a good brand or actually put yourself out there and make people aware of what you're doing. Because having people know what you're doing is important for you to create a niche within your subfield as a scientist. And in the following term, I started, um, so I took a break from research for one term just so I could focus on my academics. And then the following term, I got a new research project. And I also joined the review board for an undergraduate science journal. So uh, pub so the other way of communicating your results to the public is by publishing it. For undergraduates, it's not often easy. Sometimes you don't do um, very groundbreaking research that is uh, publishing worthy in bigger in bigger journals in like you know abj or science or nature or something like that so a lot of what under so a lot of undergraduates they opt to publish their research in undergraduate science journals which are usually of of, of their university they're always they're usually peer-reviewed science journals meaning they're legit they are registered and if you publish an article in that it does count as a published it does count as a published work for you know purpose of your resume slash applications um, and I joined the review board of that of the undergraduate science journal because it, I hoped it would give me an experience to know how the pub, uh, how publishing works, what is the what you know what things go on behind the scenes once you submit an article. I mean these are and these are the real processes that happen in with real with bigger with bigger more popular journals. Except since this is managed by us undergrads and you know a few mentors, it is more downsized and more undergrad friendly. And I joined the review board. I worked with them. I got to review articles from not from uh, different fields, like from life sciences, from geography, and also got in track with a lot of students uh, from different fields, but all of the, all of whom were doing research and were going to apply to grad school. And I also submitted an article based on my X-ray mapping project, and which surprisingly ended up an award. Also because it was like only the two, two, there were only like three papers in physical sciences, and it was. And I had the best pictures, so I guess it was easy to get that award. Um, and then I did a summer research at Caltech. Uh, SORF over here is just summer undergraduate research fellowship. And I had this theoretical project, which was quite different from whatever I did, because I'm not a theorist. I'm more of an observer slash experimentalist. And so theory pro this theory project was uh, sort of crucial so that because I could then really determine what kind of projects I needed to do in grad school or what are the skills that I had, what skills I needed. And the advantage of doing summer research as a part of a summer program in another institution, uh, in a lot of US institutions, they have this thing called REU, Research Experience for Undergraduates. And even I know, um, I know like in India, where from where we have a lot of students in this program, they have these similar programs in various um, national science facilities. Uh, the advantage of doing projects as a part of these summer research, summer programs is that you not only do your project, but you're exposed to a lot of other things as well. You have these continuous professional development programs. Uh, there are, you know, you have these lectures that put in touch with various other faculty in your field. You have these, you have these training programs that train you in different aspects of student life, research life. So in my time at Caltech, I had these seminars which taught me how to work on graduate app grad school applications. I had seminars which taught me on how to approach various faculty for research, uh, for research positions. And we learned how to network with our peers. We learned what were useful networking skills. We learned how to write a resume. All of these, by the way, which we will be teaching you here. Um, but yeah, doing research at another institution is quite different. It also teaches you how things can feel when you're outside of your, I guess, your familiar home ground. 
Um, and yeah, so it was a very useful experience and I got to meet some really, really cool scientists at that time. And I was, I felt more aware of what was going on, going on in my subfield. And later on the following term in following term, I was able to get another research grant to work on this new project that I started in the, earlier in the year, which was on comets. And um, I officially, and the second major that I was only thinking about and started preparing for, I was able to officially add it at that term to make it official on paper. And I also attended the AGU's, the AGU conference, American Geophysical Union. It was my first major conference and I realized it was so much different from a regular undergraduate poster session. It was a really large conference. It was held in San Francisco at that time. And it was, I think it was the last in-person conference I attended before the pandemic. I haven't attended an in-person conference ever since actually. Um, uh, it was it, it was very big. It was, I would admit it was daunting, but at the same time, it helped me put in all these lessons I learned on networking, on presentation, on science communications that I've picked up in the various programs before that. And certainly it was a challenge because we had to make a plan on how to navigate the many talks, the many posters, the many lectures that were going on at the conference. And at the same time, you need to know what it's the most useful thing you need to get out of it. So I think attending a conference at that point in my career, this was um, this this was my final year in undergrad, my fourth year. Uh, I think it was a very good decision and it was a very useful experience which went into my resume. And then eventually the following term, I proposed my senior honors thesis. So basically um, most degrees, I, I'm not going to say all because I don't know if it's true for all, but most um, degrees in most universities, they have an honors option where you would do a thesis or a project that lasts maybe an entire academic year or few terms or most or half a, sem a semester or two quarters of an academic of an academic year. You further investigate this topic of your choice and you prepare a thesis you, and you present it and you get an honors degree. And so I proposed and commenced a two part thesis because I was doing two majors. So I had to do two theses essentially. And so I just took two different aspects of comments. I took the shape of comments and activity of comments. And then, but it, I started it, it was going good, but a bigger challenge came up in the end of that um, COVID. And it was very, it was, it was a very significant change in my undergrad life because now everything shifted online. I got a summer, I got a summer internship a summer internship I've been looking for, but that got canceled like a lot of other summer programs just because everything had to be done in person. And that, that di at that time, no one really knew how to make that transition from completely in person to completely online. I also presented a part of my thesis at the re undergraduate research symposium, and I ended up submitting my senior thesis and got the honors that I applied for. Um, and so because I took the term off for another research position, as you recall, I, said, I mentioned a little earlier, I had to take an extra term uh, to make up for the last few classes. I, uh, my summer would have been empty, but then I took up something called some, uh, some of my, gen my general education classes because I had to fulfill those requirements. And I started, and it was at this point, I started my research for grad schools. Uh, when I started my undergrad, I was always aware that I wanted to apply to graduate schools. So um, I made sure I was on top of my work. You will have you will have a session on how graduate graduate school applications work. So I'm not going to go in depth into it, but I just wanted to put it here so that you understand the timeline of where or t the timeline of how I ended up here. And then obviously I had a virtual, and obviously there was a time when a lot of people were having virtual conferences. I was able to attend one to present some part of my thesis. And I was also able to write a guest Astrobytes article. If you don't know, you all should look it up. Astrobytes is this really nice science journal that comes under AAS where um, graduate students um, write uh, articles based on recent publications. They basically make actual science papers a lot more easier to understand and shorter and much less boring. And occasionally undergrads who do research can write guest articles like I once wrote. And so eventually got into grad school and last um, last year, August, I started graduate school and now I'm working on my first project. I have attended a few workshops. I've done a lot of outreach. But I would highlight participating in workshops are so important like this one because um, these help you develop the necessary skills that you think, you, you may not think they are essential at some point at a given point but they would certainly prove useful to you sooner or later. So 
besides academics and research, the other two things I wanted to highlight are my involvement in outreach and student organizations. Why? Because it was very pivotal to my graduate school application and also just in my overall development as a student. So outreach is basically, you know, participating in these activities that include that help you communicate, help you bring science and actual hardcore research to the public of all kinds. So I worked at a meteorite gallery because I did meteorite research at some point. I volunteered at science fairs, at telescope viewings, and I also gave talks and I still do to children and to schools. And I help in organizing school level science events, like, you know, judging at a science fair exhibition or being a proctor at Science Olympiad and writing the Science Olympiad exams at state levels, since stuff like that. And student organizations, I and I, I did was a part of science level student organizations, which helped me um, develop some important team building, team coordination skills. I worked with a science and a space science and engineering group. I'm not an engineer, but I did learn some engineering skills from that. I also worked with this news media group that helped me work on my writing and communication in general. So I know I've gone over time, but just a few main takeaways from the reason why you have mentor profiles is so that you understand where each of your mentors came from, how their journey to where they are today to sort of give you a slice of their life and hopefully help you, uh, hopefully inspire you to do something great and accelerate your journey towards where you want to be. So the main takeaways that I that I, I guess I can give to you when I look back at my life is one, your academic journey is not just about class or grades. As, your, when, as you would learn in your grad school application session, research is really, really important. So is your involvement in a lot of other activities. Uh, finding research opportunities is extremely important if you, if you plan to pursue grad school, because you should be able to convince your admissions committee that you're capable and you're interested about uh, diving into a question and working till you find a workable solution to that question. Uh, teamwork and public interaction is a very important part of science. You should because science is not done individually; it's done as groups. And you're not a scientist unless you can communicate those results to your, the public, not just your scientific community, but just but like people from other fields and just people who are not scientists at all. And that's useful in your training as a scientist, and that comes from participating in outreach events and just talking to people about what you do in general. And sometimes taking a step back from school or science or your regular academic life can give you a perspective and help you reconsider and be firm in your choices. And that was uh, very important. And that happened to me when I took my term off and when I talked to, when I was working with other non sciencey groups. And as last but not the least, professional development workshops are very, very useful. This workshop right here, it is a useful platform for you to learn these skills that you need, which you may or may not learn in classrooms. But you should keep that going even when you're in graduate school. And once you've learned enough, you can come back as a mentor and train even younger students. So yeah, that's about me. If you have any questions, don't feel uh, don't feel shy. Feel free to email me or any of your other mentors. I'm sure we all have valuable lessons to give you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. I'm sure the student will find your tips very helpful. I totally agree with them. All right, before we end, let me remind everyone to take a look at the assignment online and the reading assignment. Special notes, our next session next week actually clashes with uh, the American Independence Day. So we'll actually have a lecture on Tuesday, same time. Um, yeah, before then, take care, everyone. See you next week.